as Michael Schumann. He will talk about internal languages for higher character space. Thanks very much. Uh, <coughs> so uh, I guess you can't see uh, the other parts of the outline for whatever reason. Um, well, yeah, you can see them at the top. Okay, so I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to first. I'm going to tell you about what I mean by internal languages for ordinary categories, uh, because that's a little bit uh, easier to understand. And then I will say a few words about how one might generalize this to higher categories and how it's related to the uh, special year that we're all here for. And then I'll mention a few uh, research problems that I and other people have been working on, and I hope to continue working on this year. So let me begin by. Uh, quoting this informal version of Gödel's incompleteness theorem that no strong and sensible formal system has a unique model. Uh, but I'm interested more generally in the situation uh, that where the theorem doesn't necessarily apply verbatim, but we have some formal system, and it turns out that it doesn't have a unique model for whatever reason. Uh, and in this sort of situation, that we're, we're, there are a couple of different possible reactions we could have. On the one hand, we could say, oh no, I thought I was studying one thing, but actually it turns out that I might have been studying something completely different without realizing it. Uh, and we might be really distressed. Or we might say, hey, that's pretty cool. Actually, all of my theorems are more general than I thought they were, because they don't apply just to this one thing that I thought I was studying, but they also apply to all these other situations as well, all these other models of my formal system. So this is something that we're actually, I think, as mathematicians, we're very familiar with in many in, in simpler contexts. For instance, uh, here's an example of a formal system, grade school arithmetic. And when we're in grade school, we usually think about the real numbers or the rational numbers. But actually, the, the, or, the rules of arithmetic apply to arbitrary fields or rings or whatever, depending on what rules you're using. And we're familiar with the idea that this is a really useful generalization. Uh, a slightly uh, more advanced example is Euclid's pure geometry, which uh, Euclid thought uh, he was studying uh, ge geometry of flat space in the real world. And eventually, people realized that there were all these non-Euclidean geometries as well, but the same pure geometry without using the parallel postulate applies in all these cases. And this is also a really useful thing. More recently, uh, Gödel's actual theorem was applied to systems like Zermelo-Frankel set theory. When people were studying these sets of axioms, they thought they were studying the real universe of sets, whatever that means. Uh, and, but then eventually, people realized that there were alternative worlds uh, that could be used to model set theory. Gödel and Cohen found forcing models and constructible models and so on. Uh, and so. Uh, people are uh, then eventually people started to exploit these alternative worlds in which we can do all of mathematics because a set theoretic sort of foundational system can be used on which to build all of mathematics and it turns out to also be really useful to do all of mathematics in other different contexts. Uh, however, set theoretic foundations are not really ideal for doing this sort of thing. There are various you can do it to up to a, up to a point, but there are certain obstacles that get in the way. So it's a little bit better to choose type theory as a foundation for mathematics. Some other people have talked about type theory, so you've probably heard about it. Uh, all you need to know about type theory for this talk is that it concerns basic objects called types, which are kind of like sets. And types contain things called terms, which are kind of like elements of sets. And we write A colon A, big A, to mean that there's a term belongs to a type. And then there's this sort of thing called a typing judgment, which says given a variable of type A, then there's this term B, which belongs to type B. And you can have a, more than one variable and so on as well. And so then we can build up mathematics out of types the same way that we build mathematics out of sets. Um, now, type theory is nice because it's, uh, it's, nice, it, it's very easy to talk about alternative models for type theory. Uh, because if we have an arbitrary category with appropriate structure, then we can interpret type theory inside of that category. In the following, according to the following dictionary, a type corresponds to an object of the category, and a term of this sort corresponds to a morphism between the corresponding objects of the category. And now everything that we do inside of the type theory can be translated across this dictionary to become a statement about objects and morphisms in that category. Now, that, there's work that goes into that. Uh, uh, but it's nevertheless true, and it turns out to be really useful. So the slogan is that if I give you a category uh, with suitable structure, then internally to that category, the objects of that category look like sets. So what I mean by that is that we can reason about types uh, and tr treating them sort of in sort of a set-like way, and then everything we prove will still be true about objects of that category, because we're sort of working internally in that world of mathematics. So here's an example of the sort of thing that is, is useful to do in this, in this sort of framework. I can define a group inside of type theory by giving you a type together with the identity and multiplication and inverse operations formulized inside of type theory, satisfying certain axioms. And now when I internalize this in, in, in all sorts of different categories, I get all sorts of different groups. If 
I do it in sets, I get an ordinary notion of group. If I do it in topological spaces, I get a topological group. You can get a Lie group or a sheaf of groups or a Hopf algebra, depending on where I internalize the notion of a group. And so all these different definitions fall out automatically from the abstract definition of a group inside of type theory. Moreover, all sorts of theorems that we could prove about groups inside of type theory are still true in all of these other models. So for instance, we can prove inside of type theory that the inversion map of a group is unique. Uh, and now it, then it follows automatically that in any model of the type theory in any category, the inversion map of the corresponding group object is unique for topological groups, Lie groups, and so on, and particular Hopf algebras. For a Hopf algebra, the inversion map is called an antipode. And if you actually sit down and try to prove by working with the elements of a Hopf algebra that the antipode is unique, then it's kind of tricky. I mean, you can do it, but it's a lot easier to just quote a general theorem about group objects in arbitrary categories. So this is just uh, uh, the beginning of, of the usefulness of this, of this whole structure. This is a very simple example, but in much more complicated situations, it turns out to be really useful to be able to argue internally in this way. One more thing I want to say about internal languages for ordinary categories. Uh, oh, that's, I forgot about this. So yeah, uh, one, one caveat that you have to remember is that uh, not all classical reasoning is valid internally. So there are, there are certain rules of inference, like the law of excluded middle, everything is either true or false, and the axiom of choice, which are usually false when we start internalizing in arbitrary categories. So uh, that's a good reason to avoid using those things whenever possible, because then your mathematics will be valid more generally. You've used fewer hypotheses. You've proven a better theorem. Uh, whether or not you believe that these things are actually true in the real world, they're going to be false in these internalized worlds. Uh, and there's a, if you've never tried, tried doing mathematics without these things, there's a surprising amount left that you can still do. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's still really useful. The last thing I want to say about internal languages for ordinary categories is that so far we've been talking about classically true statements that are still true when we internalize in other contexts. But we can also consider classically false statements, um, which are sort of false about sets or, or things built out of sets in, in the way we usually think about mathematics. But they might nevertheless become true when we internalize in some other world. So here are some examples of statements like this. All functions from the reals to the reals are continuous. All functions on the natural numbers are computable. Or maybe there exist actual infinitesimal real numbers that we can do calculus in the style of Newton and Leibniz with. These are false statements in the ordinary mathematics that we do in set theory, but they might be true. And in fact, these are, all of these statements are true in some particular models. And so if we want to, we can add these as axioms to type theory. And then we'll be working with a new formal system, which does not, no longer admits the original models, but it admits these other new models in these other worlds. So this is also a useful thing to do, because then those other worlds can be built out of ordinary sets. And then we could interpret everything in those models back in the original universe. So that was my lightning overview of internal languages for categories uh, and their usefulness. So now let me say a little bit about higher categories. What is a higher category? Well, uh, you might have heard of them before. They're, they're getting a lot of press nowadays. Uh, a higher category is a category together with Higher morphisms. Morphisms are homotopies that relate its morphisms. So in addition to morphisms between objects, we have morphisms between morphisms, morphisms between morphisms between morphisms, and so on. Uh, depending on how high your category is, they can go on forever. I'm going to be interested only today in infinity one categories where all of these morphisms above level two are invertible. So they're all either isomorphisms or inverse or uh, equivalences or whatever suitable notion that is. And it takes some work to formalize what you mean by a higher category, but I'm not going to worry about that. There are various different things you can do. Um, here's some examples of higher categories. Topological spaces, where the higher morphisms are homotopies and higher homotopies. Uh, simplicial sets and other sorts of similar models for things like topological spaces with similar sorts of homotopies. Chain complexes, where we have chain homotopies and higher homotopies. Or categories, where the higher morphisms are natural transformations and maybe higher versions of those. Or spectra, simplicial sheaves. All these things are all over the place nowadays. Uh, topological spaces and simplicial sets, which are equivalent as a higher category, give us the original model, which is the, the sort of the higher category, which is analogous to the category of sets. And so when we sort of do homotopical mathematics, or higher categorical mathematics, we sort of think originally we're talking about spaces or, or, or uh, these homotopy types, these sorts of things. And then when we internalize, we're going to work in other infinity one categories, other higher categories. So the absolutely magical fact, which is the thing which has brought all of us together here to work uh, at, for the special year, is that uh, one of the most natural type theories, uh, the intentional type theory originally defined by Martin Luff, uh, is uh, actually naturally perfectly adapted to describe models in, in these higher categories. Because what we have is these things called intentional identity types, which uh, a couple of people have mentioned before. 
Uh, and these correspond exactly to these higher morphisms. So uh, an ordinary type, an ordinary term corresponds to a morphism. A term in inhabiting an identity type is a two morphism. An iterated identity type is a three morphism, and so on. So anything that we do in type theory together with these identity types can then be interpreted into an arbitrary, well-behaved infinity one category. And then everything that we say, all of our theorems will carry over, and all the sorts of wonderful things that I was telling you about before are still true when we do this uh, in a higher categorical world. Um, so the slogan is that just like objects of an ordinary category look like sets internally, objects of an infinity one category look like spaces or homotopy types or infinity groupoids, these, these, these things that, that the topological spaces and simplicial sets model from classical homotopy theory. So that was my lightning overview of higher categories and their internal languages. And if anyone is still with me, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, research problems that, that people have been working on and are working on this year. So the first problem is making this precise. Whenever you do anything at all with higher categories, there are coherence issues involved. And uh, you have to sort of make things strict enough that they match up with the type theory and so on. So the current progress is that we're almost to be able to prove, I feel like we're almost to be able to prove this conjecture that in any infinity one topos, which is a very uh, a particular nice kind of infinity one category, uh, we have a model of, of the type theory, the, this uh, intentional type theory. And what we've got is that we've got an almost complete model. And most of the type theory is implemented in, in this generality. Uh, uh, Peter and Michael and some other people have, have, have put on all the ingredients to this. Uh, Vladimir Vavadsky proved that you actually have a complete model to get, including the last bit was his univalence axiom, that, uh, which Dan briefly mentioned. Uh, that is, uh, he's got a model of that in the standard case, in the, the ordinary, the standard infinity one topos using simplicial sets, which is equivalent to the one using topological spaces and so on. And I managed to extend that to a, a slightly more general class of infinity one toposes. Uh, and now there's, there's, uh, we, want, we need to, to finish this up. So this is something I would really like to be able to finish this year to make this actually work. Uh, once we've got that working, the next question is, what parts of classical homotopy theory are still true internally? Uh, so we, we already we know that the law of excluded middle and the axiom of choice and so on are still are generally going to be false, just like they do for one categories. So we have to avoid using those. Another interesting thing which is false, which you don't see in the, class, in the, in the set theoretic world, is Whitehead's theorem from classical homotopy theory, which says, that's the theorem which says that if I have a map between uh, spaces which induces an isomorphism on all homotopy groups, then it's actually an equivalence of a suitable sort. Um, and so this is generally going to be false, turns out, in these higher categories. And uh, Jacob Lurie was, I think, one of the people who first realized the importance of the higher categories where Whitehead's theorem fails, uh, although he wasn't thinking in terms of the internal languages. Uh, but nevertheless, you can calculate some homotopy groups, and they do behave the way they do in <coughs> Classical homotopy theory, uh, I managed to calculate the, the fundamental group of the circle. It's the, in, the, the integers, just like it is classically. So this obviously suggests uh, a lot of generalizations. What about all the higher homotopy groups of higher spheres uh, and other sorts of spaces? Uh, given the way to define these things, how can, can we compute them? Are they actually determined by type theory? Or might it be the case that in different internal worlds of mathematics, the homotopy groups of spheres are different? I don't know. That would be lovely to, to answer this question. Uh, and uh, Guillaume and some other people are already working on this. Finally, uh, we can ask, are there interesting non-classical axioms that can be true in higher categories other than the category of spaces? And there are many different, different directions you could take this. I just want to mention one example that I've been thinking about with Urs Schreiber. Uh, there's this thing that he's invented, or he's just written down, called the cohesive infinity one topos, uh, building on work of Bill of Air. And this is uh, a higher category whose objects are uh, these, these homotopy types which are equipped with additional sort of topological or smooth structure. Uh, and uh, in the internal type theory of one of these things, it turns out that there are these things called higher modalities, uh, which I'm not going to say anything about what they are, but what, whatever they are, you can use them to describe large bits of differential cohomology and higher gauge theory. And this is the sort of thing that Ers has been working on, uh, formulating uh, a quantum, uh, quantum field theory and quantization in these, in these terms. And so it turns out that we can actually do this internally inside of type theory using this internal language. So that's. I wanted to tell you.